we thought the supplement category was for the bullshit. You told me you were at 4 million ARR and you were still on your own. The crazy part about it is I haven't built a business this big before. Imposter syndrome was really real for me. I was like, I don't want to fuck this up now. So you went from selling lights to gaming. I just really didn't have any idea what I was like passionate about or good at or how even to approach a business, start a business. For me, business is like just doing cool shit with cool people. Whether it's we're selling electrolytes or selling contact lenses or selling whatever. But that put you in, in massive debt, right? Yeah, massive, massive debt. So what convinced you to pull the plug? So talk to us about uh, Huda Beauty. I've always wanted what Huda Beauty have managed to do, you know, build a truly global business with local in its roots. And I've always wanted to do the same. Humantra has been a vessel to help people drink more water. And so we just doubled down on the electrolytes. Why electrolytes? Really good question. Um, Hi everyone and welcome to Conversations with Nudu. My guest is Charlie Wright. He is the founder of Humantra. It's an electrolytes brand that has launched here in the UAE in 2021 under the Huda Beauty Incubator program. They currently sell in the UAE and the UK with ambitions to, st to scale globally. Uh, the company has scaled tremendously over the past three years. We will definitely talk about that. Uh, how does it work? What is an electrolyte? And we're also going to talk about Charlie's journey from the UK to Dubai and uh, some of the entrepreneurial ventures that he started uh, and failed and, and what are some of the learnings out of these ventures and, and how did all of that uh, led him to become quite successful at leading Humantra. Charlie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's awesome that you're here. When we spoke, you and I, ahead of this conversation, you told me that you are building a real business, a business that makes revenues and surprise, surprise, uh, profits, right? And you've been building this business for three years, uh, which is amazing. But I want to take our listeners through your journey because I think your story is very, very interesting. So maybe walk us through, you know, getting to arriving to Dubai in, in 2014 and uh, and like, how did you, how did you get started here? Yeah. So I'd say I had a pretty dreamy upbringing, to be honest. Um, my parents, brilliant, phenomenal, uh, enjoyed school, probably wasn't the most academic at school. I had great teachers. And I found that when I was with great teachers, I always worked harder, studied harder, probably perform better. I think had I not had great teachers, I'd have struggled at school. But just like most teenagers, didn't really have a clue what I wanted to do. I think I went to university under the pretense that I needed to get like a white collar job, um, a career. And so I studied law at university at Exeter. Which is an interesting choice for someone who calls themselves not very academic. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, look, again, I think that if I look at my whole life, it's just come down to hard work. And I think if I look back at my law degree, it taught me a few key things like how to write and frame arguments, which was like priceless today. And then I think how to public speak, which is really important at the time. But like the day to day of the studying, what we were actually studying. And then I think the eventual career on the other side of the university just did not resonate with me one bit. I disliked it. But I think one thing my parents have always taught me is like, never give up, just see it through. Um, it'll be worth it. So I did that for three years and I don't know, I just, I just couldn't wait. Same thing at school. I couldn't wait to leave school and go and do the next thing. At university, I like couldn't wait to leave university and go and do the next thing. But I think when the day came and the university was finished and I hadn't had this structure of education and higher education, you know, go and get these A-levels, go and get this degree. Once all that was removed from me, I was, I felt a little bit lost. Maybe I lost a bit of identity as well. I think I thrive really well in structured environments. And at the time, like I'd had it all mapped out for me. In theory, it was like school, university, and then like grad job. job. And then once you have a grad job and then you maybe stay there for however long. But I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this city type grad job you know i was applying for like internships i did some internships and i, I disliked them it wasn't the idea of work it was just like doing something that i really didn't care about and i finished university and then decided that 
I wanted to leave the UK. And at the time, my my girlfriend got a job with Emirates. Um, she moved here and I was like, well, why not? And then sort of fast forward with pretty much no plan whatsoever, found myself on a plane coming to Dubai. And then what we're pretty much 11 years on now. And, you know, Dubai has been home ever since. Then I managed to really get what was perceived to be a grad job for a Swedish lighting manufacturer, which I look back on was nowhere near what I thought it was. But I was working in like retail sales, selling lights to like Nike, H&M. And I was thinking, oh, that's really cool. And so I realized no one cares about the lights in Nike and H&M. But, <laughs> you know, in hindsight, it taught me some incredibly valuable skills. You know, I was in a manufacturing business selling the product. So I got exposed to pretty much every facet of a business, um, you know, from semblance of P&L management at a pretty young age to the manufacturing supply chain process. And I quickly realized you couldn't just place orders and expect your goods to arrive in, in four weeks. You know, there's a manufacturing process, what that takes, raw parts, process, delivery. And I think I only really realized maybe in the last couple of years how beneficial that whole life cycle of a sales process was. And so my career essentially was mapped out for me. You know, I'd do this, 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 grow a team, grow the market, X, Y, Z. And I thought that was going to be amazing. I thought that's what my parents always wanted for me. I thought that's what I should be doing anyway. It's interesting because when you like study law, you know, it, it, it puts you on a certain career track, right? Like you, you go work in a law firm and then you go on a track to become a partner and a yeah. senior partner. And, and I mean, it has a it has a specific route or you can maybe work in a, in a company and a big company. Uh, but you, you came here and you did something, uh, you did something different. Like really, I think everything's transferable. Yeah. And I think it was just education for me. It was like demonstrating that I could do something for a, a perceived long period of time. Like, I think the actual real education process around doing that particular career comes later on. If you go and do, you know, you go and study for the bar, et cetera. I think university, it's a case of here's a topic, go and learn it and be in a, an amazing position then to reframe it and give your opinion and substantiate it with, with other people's opinions. But again, it goes back to the point, it helped me write, it helped me frame arguments and it helped me public talk. And so I'll always look back on it with really fond memories. I would love to know how many people on my course then went on to have successful careers as lawyers. Like I, I don't, I'd love to know stats on what people study and then what they go on and do. Yeah, I think a lot of people end up doing different things, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's, it's what you said, you know, at 17 years old, you have to make this really yeah. big life choice and you have no idea what you want to do. And no. you do something realize I don't actually like that. And then you end up working something else. Yeah. Giving children a choice and what they want to do at 17 is dangerous. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think my parents always said like, you, you need to go and, and do your education, go to university, and then you're in a position then to go and choose what you want to do. So, so you did the job for, uh, for three, four years yeah. and then you, you found your way into entrepreneurship. Yeah. Uh, why did you decide to start your own business? So, um, good question. Which was a gaming company, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you went from selling lights to gaming. Yeah. So I was, I think it was just before my 27th birthday and I went to, um, to Sweden for like a retail conference. And even at like 27, we had to talk to some of the key leaders in the business. Um, and I came back from that trip and I was like, damn, like, you know, can I, can I keep doing this? Like, what am I going to think when I'm 30? Am I going to be happy? And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at something that I really don't like doing. Like, how good could I be at something that I was actually passionate about or actually enjoyed? And I don't know, I just felt super invigorated. And I guess it came with like youthful exuberance as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I had very little responsibility. And I was like, right, I'm done with this. Like, this is just not what I want to do anymore. And I remember I went in and I resigned. And my boss at the time was like, why don't you go and think about this? Like, take some time out. And I was like pretty clear in my mind that I was done with the corporate life. And then I remember sat at my desk. I bought a desk. You know, I was like, right, this is going to be, this is the new start for me. And I just really didn't have any idea what I was like passionate about or good at or how even to approach a business, start a business. I loved gaming. I loved playing games. For me, it was a switch off from work. And I realized you, you don't get any more thanks for working endless hours and um, 
letting it affect you on weekends. I used to dread Saturday nights because back then, obviously, the weekend was Friday, Saturday. And I used to love it because football would be on a Saturday afternoon. I'd watch the football, but immediately as the football finished, I was like, oh my God, it's it's Saturday night. I've got to go to work tomorrow. Hated it. And so like I felt like reinvigorated and such that I was never going to try and escape a nine to five. Um, <laughs> I saw a gap in the market and as such that I think esports and gaming was booming in the Western world. And it really opened my eye up to what people in the West were doing at the time. And I think that's been a, a strong semblance of how I've maybe built businesses here to varying degrees of success, sort of identifying what's working elsewhere, seeing a gap in the market here and, and localizing a version for it to thrive in the region. I don't think I've done it very well to this point, well, humanity differently, but prior to that. And yes, yeah, started building a, a tech business when I they didn't know a single thing about technology at the time. I Can like, you like name maybe two of the biggest challenges that you faced? Uh, um, building yeah, that? I didn't really know like what what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't have a strategy. I didn't have a plan. And then I think really like money. How I, did you build it? Um, Found a developer. I mean, how, so, how yeah, do you build it? Use, a... use, use outsourced resources to begin with, which costs a lot of money. And I think... The best part about it all is that like at the start, you know, I had a good amount, a solid amount of money coming out of work anyway. Um, so when you've got capital, you're like, wow, this is great. And you don't really have the foresight to think I need to spread this over two, three years. So I went heavy at the start, which was probably the best and worst thing I ever did. So I started really hot. Great. Amazing. And then I quickly realized when, you know, revenue wasn't coming in and then I'm in this awful position where I'm like, oh no, but if I get loads of users and then it will make sense and you're trying to, I think it was just this daily trying to convince myself it was going to work, which I can imagine a lot of people go through. Yeah. Um, it's it, that uh, sunk cost. We call 100%. it like I've, I've done yeah. so much effort. I've put in so much money in it. If I put in a little bit more, if yeah. I, if I work a little bit harder, uh, it's going to work. It's akin to gambling, right? That's, I think, how I look at it. And it was just like this addictive cycle, but it was also having a horrific effect on me mentally, relationships, friendships, the lot were just in the gutter because I was under this like false perception that if I just kept going, keep working on something, it would work suddenly, something would happen. And the tides would change. So you built a game and you were trying to get users no, so for built, it? Essentially, we'd built a platform that would essentially facilitate uh, like online competitions for gamers in the Middle East. Because okay. it wasn't only like localized versions. I didn't speak Arabic. Yeah, I wanted to build like a, a multilingual platform, mainly for Arabic gamers to be able to go on and play in competitions rather than having to log on a, a platform in the UK and, and you know not being able to maybe speak the language properly, use it correctly. It was flawed entirely, but I think you're seeing now like with Saudi's big push into esports and gaming, maybe it maybe like timing was massively off. I think so. Um, Cause like it's kind of esports, right? Yes. Like an early version of, yeah, of esports. Definitely. And that you're seeing people in the region doing some amazing things now that it's absolutely not because of anything I was doing, certainly. But I think the only sort of saving grace I have was that I think I spotted something early, but maybe I was, well, there was no moment. I was too early anyway. And it just taught me everything. I went into it thinking at 27, I was like, I'd love to do an MBA. Um, I'd look because further learning was great for me. And I was like, amazing. Would love to do it. You know, I wanted to go to the U S to do it. I had this obsession with the U S and then I realized after 12 months of doing my own thing, that it was way better than an MBA. Just spending your own money trying to make something work. But that put like, you in, in massive debt, right? Yeah, massive, massive debt. So you 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 were paying you were paying for your company off your credit card. Yeah, I said to you, like, I think when people rack up credit card debts, like they may have things to show for them. I didn't. I remember, you know, paying rent on my credit card. I would go out and take cash out of the credit card just to pay my minimum off. So it was just like spiraling out of control. I felt like I didn't have any other option. I was like, in me, I always thought I could be successful and it, it wasn't going to be that pursuit, but I knew if I just kept going, I'd figure it out somehow. And I think that that blind faith was great at the time, but also it can be super dangerous. So what convinced you to pull the plug? Um, my friend Christian came around one Christmas 
And he, him and his wife, Emma, have got an incredible interior design studio here. They do some great work. Um, but he'd sort of grown a little bit tired with dealing with clients on client side. He's like, I would just love to just go and have like a consumer facing business, sell a product, super simple. And I was like, oh yeah, that sounds good. Because at the time, like trying to explain to your dad that I was at a gaming business was really difficult trying to explain to anyone and i was like yeah it's really tough you know actually maybe doing something with someone will be like really enjoyable i think i've learned a lot in in this pursuit that can maybe lend itself to this one and i think just having somebody there with you to help you build it was quite enticing and i went back to this idea like i did with the gaming piece of like what works elsewhere and um we'd seen a couple of big businesses in the us and the uk in contact lenses direct to consumer, you know, manufacturing sort of white label products, creating a marketing piece around them and doing really well. And I was paying over the odds for lenses in the region anyway, They're really expensive. And so we were like, yeah, let's, let's start, let's, let's build a business in, in contact lenses. And I remember saying to my, my, my fiance at the time, I was like, I'm sorry, my wife at the time, I was like, I'm going to go again. And I think <laughs> I, I, I can remember her face now and i think i think that was the writing on the wall anyway but yeah i think i still had this like childlike energy to go and do something again i was like i've clearly like got this one wrong but it never deterred me to go and do something again and so yeah started hoppy with christian in 2019 2018 i think around there we flew to thailand sorry taiwan to to, to go and meet factories talk them down from crazy high MOQs to small MOQs to help us launch the business. Um, Minimum order quantity. Yeah, I think right? when, we, when I first rang the factory, it was like 100,000 units. It was like $600,000. Um, I was like, absolutely no way. And we got them down to like 5,000 units when we went over. It was, it was like a great experience. And suddenly it was like, okay, I'm starting to remember things I'd learned previously, selling lights. Um, and we launched the business in January of 21. And it was like, wicked, this is this is easy. Like we sold a load of lenses in month one. It was relative at the time. Like I'm not talking like thousands and thousands of units, but we were like, this is a great start. And I remember going for a burger with a couple of friends in early February. And my mate Tommy said like, there was we were hearing stuff about coronavirus at the time as well that they were calling it. And he's like, do you think it will have an effect? And I was like, no chance, no way. And then three weeks later, COVID hit and, things changed massively. I mean, it's interesting because a lot of e-commerce businesses did really, really well yeah. in COVID, but you had like one of one of the issues you had was supply chain, right? Yeah. So we manufactured um, through third party in Taiwan. And at the time we were shipping everything from like a 3PL in Hong Kong. And then suddenly like planes weren't coming into the country. So we couldn't even get products here quickly, which was frustrating. And then... I think really COVID for some econ businesses boomed, but for others, I think a lot of people looked inwards and thought like, how can I cut spend? And contact lenses became sort of, if people weren't leaving the house, so people I think were just wearing their glasses at home, people were leaving Dubai. I think that was one of the sort of the most gut-wrenching part of reading customer tickets is people were cancelling. And the reason why is because they've, they've lost their job and they're going back to the UK or going back wherever home was. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. I think it was the first three or four weeks. And then I think it, it then forced us to find a more local alternative for 3PL. We moved all our stock here and we sort of used it to our advantage, changed the offer of, of the lenses, how we got people on subscription. And I think those moves then changed the business's fortunes pretty quickly. We then looked inwards. We didn't have, again, went back to that point, had no money left really. So had to really learn everything ourselves. And I remember being like, in that period of lockdown on my own with, with my two dogs at the time, Duke and Wesley. And I was like, right, well, we can't afford to pay anyone to do our Facebook ads. I need to learn how to do them. And suddenly I think that being forced then to try and learn a skill was, I was almost back to being in school again. And I had like a structure. I reached out to loads of people on Twitter at the time that helped me, did some courses. And I think that that then forced, it forced our hand. We needed to learn how to do some semblance of, performance marketing ourselves, email marketing, which is the best thing we did, saved a huge cost, which was great. And we used, you know, 
upskilled in turn the need to be able to do things ourselves much more less reliant on other people i think it was a big shift for me because before i'd really thought oh my god i need everyone's help to do this yeah and then suddenly i was in a position where i was like i can do a lot of it and then i think got into my mindset then of and I, I would call it setting fire to money. Like when you're spending on these platforms, like of course there's huge upside potential, but at the same time you are literally setting fire to your money. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great learning moment, by the way, for for our audiences. Uh, it's like as an entrepreneur, you you, I feel like you always need to do everything yourself up until the point that you can't, yeah. and only then at that point you can like start hiring people. I mean, of course, if you're building an e-commerce business, yes, you can do that. But if it's something super technical, obviously, no, you need like uh, experts in, in that field. But I think for, for a lot of businesses, you can do things pretty much on your own for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's a big misconception, right? I, you don't need to be great at business to have a great business. Um, you just need to be resourceful. 100%. Really, um, right? Yeah, exactly. I think to a certain degree, I think that in that initial period, like there is there is nothing that can replace like just working hard. But then beyond, and I look at where we are today, like I'm bringing people around me that are far better at certain areas of business yeah. than I am. Steve Jobs was the, I mean, he calls himself the conductor of the orchestra, right? Yeah. It's about getting the right people around well, you. Well, he to... can only do that once you're at a certain scale, 100%. which is where you are today, yeah. right? Is there a piece of advice or or something that you that you can share on, you know, for, for those that might be contemplating a similar business? Is there something maybe to look out for uh, or, or, or some kind of advice if you're trying to build uh, a business like that? Having a great product isn't a differentiator. You have to assume that everybody in the market has got a great product. Mm -hmm. So don't try and sell on that as your only USP. I think for a long time at Hoppy, like we sort of had this mindset that we probably knew that, you know, the bigger pharmaceutical companies had better products. And so we simply couldn't be like, our product is better X, Y, Z for these reasons. It needed to be everything else. We lent things to, into things that were like things that we knew we could do better i.e. like customer service was important, like the most important thing to us because like seeing somebody like choose your business over somebody else's business, like at the time meant literally the world, still does now. And it's still wild when I go in the gym and see people drinking Humantra or especially in the UK being sort of our, you know, newer market, it's wild. But, you know, we knew that we could reply to customers super quickly, like surprise and delight was everything. I was like, it's really hard to get a, get somebody to buy your product. So our mindset was like, well, how can we ensure that they never go anywhere else? And that just became our like entire focus. Like once we get them, which is hard enough as it is, how do we keep them? And it was just like, actually, it was crazy in the Middle East at the time as well. Like just by replying to customers, we were being like praised as great customer service because i think at the time especially in covid bigger brands just were just slammed and they couldn't reply to people there was no communication and i think like an extension of just who i am as a person anyway just being like open upfront and honest anyway like if we couldn't deliver something on time like we'd just tell customers yeah and so it's like don't just i think a lot of people have this perception that if you've got a business you need to pretend that you're massive and you're this big organization super successful it was just a case of like, okay, we are small. We're up against people. Like embrace that. Like talk to customers. Like it's just like you are a small business. You don't need to hide against that. Um, I read a great email thread from um, a founder in the US that um, he got, he was selling razors at the time and razor blades. And a customer emailed in saying like, you know, I could go and buy some random, you know, big corporation brand razor blades on Amazon and get free delivery, whereas your delivery is like two or three pounds. And the founder replied back saying like, totally get that. That's your prerogative. But the reason why we charge this is because we're a small business, husband and wife, we pack up all our orders. And there was a nice like email associated to it. And the customer immediately replied saying like, totally get it. You've got my service. I'll always buy your razors. Don't like pretend that you're massive like lean into being able to reply to a customer service to yourself, put your name on it, um, talk to consumers. And I think for me, that was like the best sounding ground for yeah. everything. I'm seeing more of that, by the way. I like sometimes I'm browsing through Instagram and I'm like finding these new like clothing brands. So I bought a pair of pants the other day and 
after Bora, I get an email from the two designers that made those pants. And it's very similar yeah. like to what you're describing, like talking about how they started and their journey and why they're building their products, et cetera. Yeah. So it's it's a nice personal touch. Yeah. Um, and, and basically, so if I heard you right, what you're saying is that the product will get commoditized after after a while, right? Even if you're a first mover, someone else is going to come and do yeah. the same. 100%. So it's all about brand and and customer customer service ultimately yeah i think brand's an interesting one for me i've always had this mindset that like a lot of people try and focus on creating brand from day one if i look back at hoppy we had we came up with the name in like five or ten minutes we got a super simple logo we spent no money on it and i remember previously with my gaming business i spent what was then a lot of money on like what the branding looked like, what the name was, and that created a huge deal around it. And no one really gave a shit as much as I did. And I think that was a realization for me where I think a lot of people try and create brand and think it just is something you can create. Whereas I think having looked now with hindsight with Humantra, like you don't just create brand and you, you certainly aren't the one to say you've got one. And so it's like focus on what's in your control, like Build it with authenticity and with the best intentions. And if you are, if the timing's right, your execution's great, and you ride the punches, then you have the ability then to like be labeled a brand as time goes on. I mean, yes and no. I mean, when we talked about Humantra, right? I, I told you how I came across it. I, I came across it on Instagram as well. Uh, where I was browsing, I was thinking, oh, wow, that looks pretty cool. Uh, you have a really, really nice brand that stands out, like super colorful, uh, nice fonts. I mean, it, it looks it looks really nice. And um, uh, and then I had heard someone else talk about it and then I bought it. I think that the key learning there is like a lot of people try and create their own noise mm -hmm. and then expect consumers to buy it. My logic, especially with Humantra, having the learnings I did was like, I'm not going to try and create noise. I'm just going to try and get products in the right people's hands, like get people buying the product. And then in itself, then it create the product and the people then create the noise for you. I think so many people have focused on like creating a lot of fluff to begin with. Okay. Whereas for me, it was like, let's just do the basics, get people buying product and let them talk for us. And so you're probably like, you, you know, you the one, oh, this, I think consumers then looked at it being like a great brand. It was never like, I was never thinking like, let's just build a great brand from day one. Yeah, but you do, you did, you know, we were talking that, uh, that you have a great product, right? And you said it's a, it's a prerequisite. Like it has yeah. to be, it has to be great. So isn't brand part of that? It, it, it is, but I think, like, I think people just make it out to be what it's not. Like whether people are chasing like PR stories and it, and it just means nothing. Okay. I think the region has also been like brandished with businesses creating hype that didn't then lack substance. My logic was very much like, I'm going to try and build substance quietly in the background and inadvertently that then should lend itself to hyping itself up. I've always been cognizant that it's all well and good me saying our product's great and people should buy it. But what I really wanted was people saying it for us. And I think that then has allowed the business to sort of have that flywheel of growth and brand perception which like, so it hasn't come being like, oh, I'm going to build a community or I'm going to build a brand. Those are byproducts of like doing the basics correctly, in my opinion. Which is what in your case? Um, great product prerequisite. You just have to have it. How, like explaining why people need it and why it's going to benefit them. But I think it just comes down to execution. Like product for us is not just the sachets. Product is like, every touch point you have with the business from when you first see an ad about Humantra, the website is product, the post-purchase emails, all product, the customer services, product deliveries, product, all of that. I think we don't look at product as just what you consume from a, an actual tangible substance. It's everything you interact with from a brand level. And I think that just became this core focus of like leaning into our being small and agile and quick with deliveries. You know, we had a, we were delivering, it was hanging on the website, it was like one to two days, but I knew we could deliver within 24 hours. And then seeing people being like, quickest delivery ever, amazing. The surprise and delight just came through. Did you read the Zappos book? Yeah, I did, yeah. Like, Tony's a 
a great example of building a great business, but it comes back down to just like doing things really well. And I think that that just... What is it called? Delivering happiness, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I was researching for this uh, for this conversation, I, I looked at, you know, uh, the global market yeah. for uh, for electrolytes, right? And I have, uh, in, in 2023, the global electrolyte drink market was $40 billion. Uh, and, and, and this year, it's expected to be about $42.5 billion. 2% of that is in the Middle East, which which is, is quite small. I mean, nascent, let's say here. And, and obviously, it's not a, like, it's it's a bit of a red ocean. I mean, I try to see who else is doing electrolytes. Obviously, you have the big guys like Pepsi and and uh, and Coca Cola doing the yeah. the drinks, right? You have Abbott, which I was surprised, which is a pharmaceutical company, Kraft. Uh, there's a lot of like U.S. brands as well. So it's a basically going back to what you what you were saying. It's 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 a crowded market relatively, and it will probably get more crowded, yeah. and and competition is gonna come. Uh, even probably from here as well in, in the UAE. I don't know if any anyone else is doing it. I'm sure people are. I'm, I'm sure people are thinking yeah. about it. So how do you stay ahead? I guess is what you were trying to say by by taking care of all the touch points. Yeah, I think we we were fortunate in as such that we created a sustainable business, which I think allowed us then to which have means time. it's profitable. Yeah, um, and I think that that gave us the greatest freedom. I think. You know, being able to build a business where you're not chasing, you know, to keep the lights on every month allows you as a founder to be, I think, much, to actually drive better value to the business. If I look at my personal life, like when I was going through money issues, all I was thinking about was like how I was going to pay the bills moving forward. And so my creativity was completely destroyed. If I had 100% mental capacity in a day, I would say 90% of that was spent on like how I'm going to pay the bills and get through. So I only had really 10% when I could really focus on the business. And it was just just completely wrong. And so I think fast forward, you know, three years into a business setting, like not being worried about making sure that we were in, we stayed alive next month gave me then like the impetus and the freedom then to be like, right, well, we can, we can go and stretch our legs here a bit. And that's freeing. So now that you're not worried about survival three years into building yeah. Humantra, what do you worry about? Um, I don't know. I think if I look from a personal perspective for a long time, like imposter syndrome is really real for me. I would wake up every morning and think like, when is this all going to end? I think I'd been conditioned for a long period of time to at the time in those moments think that I was just, I would always lose. I felt like, and it's not about feeling sorry for myself. Like I just felt like, I was like, when am I going to get a break? When is something going to go right for me? And so I think when you have gone through things not working for a really long period of time, it's very difficult when things start to work for you to be like, when is it going to go wrong? Yeah, for me, it became a real constant battle. And so that for me immediately was, I think, what was like my energy. I was like, well, I do not want, I don't want to fuck this up now. And so I'm going to work every single day. I'm going to use every ounce of my being to make sure this succeeds because I this was my chance. And so I think all those like losses became like the driving force to it, it not failing. And like, I'll always, for me, it's not always working towards something. Sometimes a little bit is running away from stuff as well. of like not being good enough or not, not working out. Not, and I think for me, that definitely is completely prevalent in my life. It's so interesting. I, like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what, what works best. Like for me, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like you. For me, it's like, I have to do more. I have to get better. I like it's. It's not. It's not enough. It's you know. I have to work harder. There's a great story about Chinese farmer, and I, I remember hearing it. Essentially, long story short, um, he's farming and one of his horses runs away. And his neighbors come around that evening and say, like, how unfortunate. And he said, maybe. The next day, that wild horse comes back, and brings with it four other wild horses. And his neighbors come around that evening and say, how amazing. And he said, maybe. <laughs> um, the next day, his son is trying to tame one of the wild horses and he falls from the back and breaks his leg. His neighbors come around the evening and 
Um, they say, how unfortunate. And he's like, maybe. <laughs> the next day, the conscription officers come around and ask, I think, under 25s to sign up to the military. And they, they wrote his son off because he had a broken leg. And the villagers come around and say, like, how amazing. And he said, maybe. And I think, I think from that story, it's like, it, life is so complex. And the consequences of misfortune or fortune are just not linear, you know? And so I don't sit here sometimes thinking, right, I'm on the path to success. Like it's all rose, it's always gonna be up. And I don't look back on any of the, the failings or the lessons learned as like they were terrible, they were losses at the time. And at the time when you're sat in those moments, they feel horrific. But I look back now and say that they were all sort of meant to happen. Um, it didn't, it never deterred me to keep pushing forward. And I'm not saying I need a pat on the back for not giving up, but I didn't really have an option to give up. So talk to us about, uh, Huda Beauty. I mean, it's, a uh, obviously a global, um, brand, huge success from the region, uh, very proud of her and, 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 uh, you know, a lot of things are starting to come out of the, the incubator. So how, how did that happen? Like, how did you, how um, did you end up there? Yeah, again, it goes back to the same sort of theme, it, very serendipitous. Um, I remember pitching Huda Beauty Investments um, in March of 21, um, Hoppy. For the contact lenses? Yeah. Okay. Um, and we had a great conversation. We, the guys were great, but we were too early for them, um, which was fine. Um, these things happen. We walked out and were like, oh, this is a shame, but um, it was meant to be. But I stayed in touch with these guys the whole time. Was super impressed with what Huda, Mona, Alia have built, you know, insane business. I love the fact that they built a, a truly global business from, from Dubai. There's not many people that have done it, especially in, you know, consumer. And so we stayed in touch. And then I, I spoke to Imad al Fay at the time, he was running the incubator program at Huda Beauty Investments. They'd created an incubator not long after we'd had this, this chat about Hoppy. And now I realize now that after that meeting, they were like, why invest in these smaller stage startups? Why don't we just start them ourselves? So it really did come full circle. You just sometimes think like, had I not gone in, had we not gone and pitched Hoppy, like where would it all be today? Had you gone? Got an investment also, or yeah. I had or, not even gone in for that. Yeah, meeting, you yeah. Know? I had not even started that business. Who knows what happens? And I think that's what's so amazing about life. And so I guess I remember going in after having these discussions and Martina on the team at HP Investments as an analyst, like her project to get to, to apply for the job at HP was like, if Hoppy was part of our portfolio, like what would we do to scale it into a, you know, a big business? And I was like, this was wicked. I was like, wow, so you used this small business of mine to, to gauge whether you're a solid candidate to go and work HB Investments and there's products all around. So it was like a pretty full circle moment for me. And I'm not saying like it was because of me at all, but it was part of that process. And at the time, um, there was sort of very two very early stage, just to call them concepts at the time. And Imad and Corin wanted somebody to come in and, and maybe help across both brands. Corin so is Corin Watts is a CEO of HP Investments. Corin's incredible, been a huge supporter of mine. And Corin was like, I think saw something in me, like really scrappy, had like spent his own money and lost a load of it. That maybe I could bring something to that program that they didn't have. And so I started doing that. We were still selling lenses at the time. And so I didn't work on the other brand. So um, they, they brought you in. They said, we have this idea. You want to do it? Yeah. So it's like, we have this, we have what we think we want to do. And at the time, the the proviso was, we were going to build a, like a holistic supplement business, i.e. that, I don't mean in ingredients, I mean, in terms of the approach to the business. And there was going to be like, a, a sleep product, a, a protein product, a greens product, an electrolyte product. And for me, it's always been like singular focus on things. And so um, we just doubled down on the electrolytes. Why electrolytes? Really good question. Um, I mean, sleep is like a big thing, I think. Obviously, supplements is a massive, yeah. probably very busy category. Yeah, though, uh, hugely, yeah, very busy category. And I think it's one of those things where if you shout the loudest and have... and you, crazy promises like you can get people buying your product and i think that that's what we saw like we we thought that we thought the supplement category was was full of bullshit um 
crazy promises. Yeah. Not great products. Um, Expensive also. Yeah, hundred percent. And there's like, and so I think internally, and the sort of from where I was looking at my own health and wellness journey at the time, I, <sighs> hydration just kept coming back. I it was the most foundational health need on the planet. And it was obviously the most unifying one and hydration doesn't discriminate. And so suddenly we had a huge pool of people we could speak to having e-com experience. It was a replenishable product, which is a really important sort of component of building an, an e-com business. And it was lightweight, we could ship it. Was sort of those two like check marks from a, an e-com perspective. And it was just all on hydration. It, again, it like it unified people. It didn't discriminate. And personally speaking, I tried so many different hacks, ways or means to try and fuel my performance. And one thing I always kept going back to was my inability to drink enough water every day. And my psyche waking up every morning thinking coffee was the answer. So I would drink coffee in the morning before workouts, wouldn't drink enough water. And I think once I started to reduce caffeine intake, prioritize hydration, we quickly realized that there was something here on hydration. We looked to what was available on the market, especially in this region, there was nothing. And we'd seen sort of certain businesses in the West, going back to that same theme that's been prevalent in all the sort of my iterations of business, that there's something here. And I think we can do it really well in the Middle East. Was it hard or easy to convince them to drop the whole suite of products? And uh, I never had a conversation to everyone and said, like, this is what we're going to do. I said, let's just start with this. And I had the intention of never doing anything else. Yeah. And I've always been one where it's like, I'm going to, again, it goes back to that like, idea of not like creating noise at the start and then not having to back it up. For me, it was all about substance. And I just wanted to build an undeniable stack of proof that I could execute on what I thought I could. And so it came down to like, let's just do this one right first. I know I'm not going to do anything else. And when we launched the, the, the business, the product was called Hydration Hat. Hydration Hat? Hi hydration Hat. Hack. And then we realized very early on that we couldn't, we couldn't call it hydration just because of local, local laws. And so we changed the name to Hack One under the proviso at the time, because again, that we would have Hack One, Two, Three, Four, and Five, which would lend itself to this like holistic system of supplements. But all, all also knowing that that was never going to happen, but it just sounded like a, a good process. And then, yeah, we changed the name to just back to Humantra about six, maybe less, maybe four or five months ago. From day one, I hated the word hack. Oh, yeah. okay. So was, the business is always called Humantra, but the product was called Hack One. But no one called it Hack One. Everyone called it Humantra. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but hack had always annoyed me from day one because hack is is everything that we aren't as a business. This isn't a short-term fix. So it was a great day to remove that moniker from the business. But we are, you know, people just refer to the products as Humantra really from day one. And it was nice to sort of move away from there. And I think as we've developed, you know, more strategy forward facing, it's very clear that the electrolyte space is where we want to be. And personally speaking, I think just doing loads of different things, shackable trades is not what I'm interested in. It's just like, I don't know I'm saying we're going to be master of one, but we'll certainly do our very best to be the master yeah. of one. So just in layman's terms, uh, what do electrolytes, like why do they work? And is it are they for everybody? And thirdly, is there a specific time that you should drink them? Yeah, so, and I think we've made this conscious effort for as a business as well, that, you know, there are certain supplement businesses that are exceptionally scientific in their nature and their branding and their marketing. There are others that are not. I think Humantra beautifully plays in this middle ground of being like, we can substantiate ourselves with science, but, you know, being an aspirational lifestyle brand is where we want to be as well. And I think we play in this beautiful middle ground. So rather than give, you know, a load of science and facts, I think the best way we approach it is that, you know, your body is made up of 75% water, you know, your brain as well. And What's crazy about that is, and, and if I look at all our consumer reviews now, you know, 70% of our reviews have people talking about like drinking more water because of Humantra, feeling better and not being able to drink water without it anymore. And so for us, it like just reaffirmed how we approached it. You know, to be optimally hydrated, you need a combination of water, the fluid and minerals of which some minerals are electrolytes. 
Without them, you're never going to be minerally hydrated, which is what your body needs. Electrolytes are... And this. even water, by the way, if you get like natural spring water, it has minerals in it. 100%. That. But, you know, yeah. you look at so like the likes of, you know, those beautiful bottles of spring water can be more expensive on the market. There's a reason why, because they have the mineral content your body needs. Mm. Um, whereas the majority of water that people are consuming these days, whether that be tap water or bottled water, lacks these minerals. You know, a lot of bottled water has no sodium in it. And what's crazy is sodium is one of the most important electrolytes on the planet. You know, our bodies need it to regulate, you know, muscle function, nerve function, cognitive ability. Um, so without them, if our body's not getting them, we don't make them naturally ourselves. So we have to supplement them in through our diet. And so we found that people, especially in the Middle East, were drinking, you know, bottle after bottle of water from the supermarket or wherever that didn't have any minerals or electrolytes in them. And some people weren't even drinking what they should be drinking every day. You know, the majority of people we speak to before we launched the business were not drinking two liters of water a day. So everyone thought they knew what they needed to do and yet people still weren't doing it. And so beyond there for us, so everyone needs electrolytes. There's no two ways about it. And from a foundational health need, you look at it, it's like, if you didn't eat for a week, you'd still be alive. If you didn't drink water for a week, unfortunately you'd be dead. It's, it's like, it's, it's black and white in that sense. Water with minerals is what, what our body needs and craves more than anything. It's what we're essentially made of. And so, of course, there are certain times or certain environments that would lend yourself to drinking more water and electrolytes, whether that be if you're working out in hot climates, because as you sweat, you lose electrolytes. But generally speaking, if you're not getting it from diet, then you're not getting it at all, really. And so we always advocate that waking up, and people don't realize that when you're asleep, you're not, you're not eating or drinking. So you're waking up in a, in a dehydrated state. What's even worse is then most people grab a coffee in the morning, which dehydrates them further. And so for us was, can we get people waking up and the first thing they drink in the morning is Humantra um, or electrolytes. And I think that that's been the ethos from day one. And I think you've seen certain brands have success with timing their products to a time of day. But for us, it's a unified problem. Everybody needs electrolytes. There are certain times when you need more of them. But for us, it's, it's beyond just needing them, I think. Humantra has been a vessel to help people drink more water. As a business, I've always wanted to be a conduit to people making better decisions. We're not a silver bullet. You have our customers email and say, can I have one Humantra and then not have, drink any more water all day? I'm like, absolutely not. You mm -hmm. don't just take this and you're suddenly hydrated and you're suddenly going to just smash the gym, smash the office, do whatever you need to do. It's, it's part of a wider new sort of health protocol you need to go on. Um, but certainly, you know, we look at it as everyone, everywhere, every day. Okay, it's it's quite sweet though. So how how do you get that uh, sweet taste? Yeah, so we use so we zero sugar, which is really important to us. So we use stevia um, to sweeten the product. Um, so the gut health is really important to us. So we need to try and find a product that sat well with people. I think having looked at feedback as well, it's been unanimous in a sense that it sits really well with people. Um, and look, it's not like we just create a random product there was method to the madness in terms of the mineral balance that we have in the product like you said earlier about there being a lots of different products on the market a lot of electrolytes in today's market are heavily indexed on sodium you know with a thousand milligrams per sachet which is a lot and it tastes super salty and what we found is that not everyone needs that every day and not everybody wants to drink something that was super salty and I think from, again, looking back at my past experience, working out how to create a successful habit in people came down to, is it easy to do? Do you look forward to it? Because the moment you put friction in there, people will do it for a little bit. Like I look at greens powders and I used to hide my greens powders in protein shakes, used to hold my nose to drink them, all of it. And it didn't stick because it was just like not enjoyable. And so for us, it's like, how can we create a habit that sticks? How can we create something that tastes good? You know, look at every other drink that people love consuming. 
and it's because they look forward to consuming it. And so we needed to do the same. And so our mineral balance is not, you know, over-indexed in sodium. It's got a lot less sodium than most brands on the market, which allows you to drink more sachets a day. And my fiance said it perfectly, you know, she would rather drink four Humantra sachets in a day with 500 ml of water, which is two liters of water, than drink 1,000 milligram of sodium sachet with 500 ml. And that just really just became the ethos with the brand is, can we get more people drinking more water, looking forward to it, which we would position as like the best thing you can do to improve your health and wellness. And it's actually the easiest thing you can do. So you got into um, Huda Beauty Incubator and did you think you would be here today in terms of like the growth that you guys have achieved? Uh, like what, what were some of the, the KPIs initially that you had? In short, no. I mean, I mean, in terms of like size of business, definitely not. I think I've always had this mindset that I would succeed at something, didn't know what that was going to be. Um, I'd like to think that at the time, it's it's Humantra. Who knows when it's all said and done in however <laughs> many years? We'll, we'll we'll see. But one thing that that environment has given me is, um, it's not an environment where you get pat, a pat on the back. It's an environment that is ever striving for more. How can we move faster? How can we do more? How do we grow? And I think having seen and getting a really close insight into Huda and Mona's mindset and their approach to business, and, you know, for, for businesses that are at that scale to still be so scrappy is incredible. And so that environment has always, I think, pushed me to do more. Um, whenever we've sat down and gone through KPI numbers in terms of revenue, I've always been like, wow, that sounds like way too much. And without being like, saying oh charlie you're great you're gonna do it it just created an environment where i thought right well i need to push for more here and it's just given me this incredible sort of springboard to approach things in a much bigger frame of mind than i ever thought possible Huda always you know dream big think big and i think one thing i learned really early on from those guys was that you know every now and then sit there and think like if money was no object or if you could have a, and coron always calls it a moonshot idea I always think like if you if what what one thing could you know transform the business, it doesn't matter how crazy it is. Like write them down, talk about them because you're in an environment where you know you start you can make things happen. Someone might know someone; these things start to happen. But I think when you're a solo entrepreneur or you're again maybe not blessed to be surrounded by people a little bit further down the line than you, then you, maybe you don't think that's possible. But you are potential is endless with everybody, and I think that. Founders in particular, me in particular, always like held myself back, being scared just how much we can grow. So did I think we'd be where we are today? Absolutely not. Did I have complete conviction in that that we could succeed always from day one? But I didn't know to what extent it was going to be. You told me you were at 4 million ARR and you were still on your own. Yeah. With like some support from uh, the incubator. Yeah. So it was actually funny. Today is... 12 months to the day since Micah joined the team. Mike is uh, our brand manager, first employee in the business full time. Um, she's a superstar. Um, she actually joined 12 months ago. And yeah, the business has grown sort of exponentially in the last 12 months. We launched in the UK pretty much 12 months ago. And that business has been, you know, fantastic for us. So yeah, for a long time, it, it was just me, but there was it's just amazing I, I mean but there were i i was thank you um uh, i think that's one thing i've always struggled with as well and i think every facet of life like being able to receive compliments is something yeah. i'm terrible <laughs> at and i think uh -huh. most people are yeah <laughs> everyone's very quick to play themselves down and say no yes. that's why but, but thank you but i had a team of people at hb while they weren't full-time in the business were sounding boards helped me with numbers 
and just gave me an environment where they got the best out of me, which I'll always be grateful for. But yeah, so now we're a team of six people. Six. Six, yeah. Which is still relatively small. Yeah, super small, small, um, which is great. We're we're agile, we're nimble, we move quickly. We're a team of doers and I think that's brilliant. And there's, there's no one part of the business that I haven't worked on myself. So I don't feel in any way shape bad you know asking people to do things i know i do them myself or i've done them yeah but we are we're going to grow quite considerably over the next sort of three four months and into next year which brings itself a whole new step of challenges you know for seven years really by the last year it was really me working by myself um and now suddenly it's a shift now from it being less about me in the weeds to me, I'm taking a, a different perspective on things and, and driving the business from a different place. Yeah, it's going to be interesting now because you you have to learn how to delegate. You have to learn how to trust other people to do what they're you know what they say they're going to do. And as I told you earlier, um, just before we started this, it's going to be interesting because you need to make sure you continue to trust your gut to make those decisions. I think one of the one of the, the the good things when you have a team is you have more brains thinking with you on on tackling a problem but also sometimes if you bring like highly accomplished people it will it will get you to doubt your own gut feel sometimes and entrepreneurs are you know it's all about that gut feel yeah sometimes e- even though you can't maybe put a number on it or justify it but sometimes you just feel it so I think this is, it's going to be an interesting shift for you. Too. Yeah, a huge shift. I, one, of, one of my favorite books is uh, Little Black Stretchy Pants by Chip Wilson, founded Lululemon. And I think one thing I really resonate with Chip is that he, he wanted to make sure that everyone that worked for him, he wanted to make them great. And he saw far more satisfaction on what those people went and did after Lululemon, whether they founded other businesses or he invested in them. I think that whole ethos of giving people environments to thrive seeing them grow and go on to amazing things is brilliant. I remember when we were interviewing for for Micah's role, I think a candidate didn't get a job asked me like how I would define success. And for me, it's like, really, it's, it's not about that necessary impact they've had on the business per se. It's like, do they then leave the business in a, a much better place to where they came into it first and foremost? Because if, if we can give them an environment for them to grow and for them to thrive as a byproduct of that, the business is going to be pushed forward and succeed as well. And and ultimately, like, I think that I'm fascinated with people and watching them grow and improve. And so like, while I understand it's going to be a completely different challenge as, you know, as a leader of a business, like it's for me now, the most exciting part of the business seeing who we're going to bring in, um, from what experiences, what they'll bring to the business. We we never want to bring yes men into the business. I think what's brilliant is that people are willing to challenge me and push me because ultimately like I still want to grow. And the crazy part about it is I haven't built a business this big before. And so I'm sure as shit want to bring people into the business that have maybe, you know, done some things that I haven't done yet that can help us steer this ship. So yeah, exciting. I acknowledge it's going to be a massive challenge, but it's all part How do you of it. deal with challenges? Um, like you, you were, you mentioned to me, you, uh, when you were fundraising, you had a, you had a shipment that came in and the products like didn't taste right or something yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> So, which, which is quite catastrophic. Yeah. Again, it goes back to that point, right? Where at the time, everything can feel like it's either a win or a loss. But back I think, to that Chinese uh, story. Of maybe. It is. I like, like, what was it? Maybe it was it. He said yeah, maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Right. You just don't know in the grand scheme of things how it's all meant to work out. And I think, like I said earlier, like my life has had a very serendipitous tone to it. Timing is everything. I think business is problem solving. That's that's all it is, right? If you expect everything to go right, then it never does. And I think when you're then not set up then to deal with a challenge, it becomes very difficult. So how do I deal with challenge? Um, like embrace it. You know, one thing we don't do if we're struggling with something is like, before if something I was struggling with something, I would just keep it and I'd internalize it and I wouldn't acknowledge it as a problem. And I'd be like, it's fine, I'll deal with it myself. Whereas now it's like immediately on the table, like guys, this is what we're facing. This is what we're struggling with, whether that's with investors, with the team. So what do you do in that moment? Is it 
communication? I mean, how, how do you solve that? I mean, that's a pretty big problem. Yeah. I think it's like understanding like the severity of the problem. And I think one thing we thought as a business at that time was, you know, we had a few people right into the business and say, had there been a change in flavor? And look, it was like pretty much like one day. So it was, you know, we managed to limit and identify a problem very quickly, which I think is also really important. I like don't sit on things and expect them to change, like act really fast. But my logic very much was like, it's not the customers that are messaging with a problem. It's the customers that don't message. And oh, then, so it reached the hand of a customer. So yeah, the, the one, customer yeah, told day, Yeah, we, that's how we flagged the oh, issue. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the customer said this doesn't taste yeah, right. And then we looked, uh, there was one particular customer and they had um, only bought lime for two years. And uh, at that point we were like, okay, this is this is real. We quickly got all over it, managed to stop selling that. And I think we it was I think it was less than 40 orders that had gone out to customers and, and we sorted it all out, rectified it. But yeah, our logic was like, it's not the people that message in, it's the people that don't that and you lose these customers. And so yeah, we just made a call and we spoke to our supply chain and they were incredible. And we created a plan of action and you can't feel sorry for yourself. Like these things happen. Um, they're to be expected. I think it's been, you know, grateful that it wasn't something else. You know, I, you know, you look at people are going through far worse. People, businesses have had far bigger problems. So it's like, I think you don't, again, everyone says it like, don't get too high when things are great. Don't get too low when things are bad. I love that. Um, action is like paramount, like have conviction, like do something and then back yourself that that's the right thing yeah. to do and get all over it and have those honest conversations with customers. Like what well, I grew up and used to think business was just like really smart men because I had this perception, my dad going to work every day in suits that knew what they were doing and that were really serious and that's what business was. And then I looked at us and, and I was like, this is what business is. Yeah. I've always said it's, for me, business is like just doing cool shit with cool people. Whether it was we're selling electrolytes or selling contact lenses or selling whatever, like it's about people. And it's about acknowledging that people can make mistakes and it's about well, how do you rectify them? So for me, it's like embrace challenge, embrace difficulties, get on the front foot, fix them, be honest about it and just do everything as authentically as you can. Does everybody on your team taste the, the flavors? Does uh, Hoda, Mona and, 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 and them, do they... Do they uh... Look, approve a, the flavors yeah i think or we, do they have an input um uh, i think in the early days we were a lot more like we co-created a lot more and then i think as the business has sort of grown its legs um you just have to be conscious that timing wise as well and and everyone trying things can be difficult that's one thing as well that you know when you're a small business process is like non-existent and so we're going through a big transition now of implementing process and how we you know, do, you know, NPD, how we do quality control on supply chain products, everything. And these things you don't get taught, you know, no one's writing a, a really cool business book on how they put process into their business. No one's reading it. So NPD is new product development. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Just new product development. No, always good to just uh, simplify the, the terms so, yeah, for people. So we have a, uh, and it depends who we're working with. You know, we've been... And what happens if they don't like a flavor? Has it ever happened? Uh, yeah. It's, it, do you know what? As well, it's, it's, it's happened before. And, you know, we did a collaboration last year with um, a big UK clothing brand, Represent, George and, and Mike, two brothers, $100 million revenue business. And the two of them built it themselves. It's an incredible business. Mm -hmm. We we're did not, a collaboration. You're not, too, you're not too far off yourself. Um, <laughs> one day, hopefully, touch wood. But yeah, we, we did a collaboration with them and... Um, the flavor was spicy mango. The reason why we did the flavor spicy mango is George loves spicy mango. And so it was incredibly authentic to what we were doing. And did everyone love the flavor? No, some people hated it. But it was authentic to George. It was exactly what we should have done. And while some people didn't like it, people absolutely loved it. And it's people have you know asked for it back many time before whether we do it again we'll see but it has the same effect in every aspect of life whether it's a flavor you launch or it's a business or it's a decision you make not everyone's going to like it not everyone's going to love it but i think if you have conviction in your thoughts and you stick to your guns and you rationalize it properly then i think people have to respect it so you know not everyone's going to love every flavor we do you know we did a, a collaboration in ramadan with deliveroo as well which is a rose flavored product and it, again, it it was incredibly popular 
for some people and of which like genuinely like probably some of the numbers on 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 the products were were fantastic but not everyone loved the rose flavored product and i think that that's just a good analogy for life really not everyone's gonna love what you do but just have conviction in your thoughts and and go about it and and with the best possible intentions. How would a collaboration with a UK brand like benefit you as a business? So what, what did that do to your business? Uh, okay, so, okay, it's a good question. I think at the time, I probably look back in Were you a, a, a UAE only business at the time? Yeah, so we, yeah, we were only selling in the UAE. Um, I think that only in hindsight have I realized how big of a seminal moment that was for the business um, with a bit more maturity. At the time, I just was fascinated by what George and Ed Brothers had built as a brand. Incredible execution. I loved their clothes, had done for years and years and years. And so I'd sent product to George in when we first had, I remember the first samples I sent to George to try. And we built up a friendship through that. And it just became, again, goes back to that cool people, cool shit, cool people doing, you know, cool shit. We were just having fun. It made sense. It was really authentic. And it was really exciting. And for me at the time, I was like, wow, you know, Represent is an incredibly big business. This is going to be great for us. Um, and we launched that in July of last year. And then we launched in the UK in August. Oh, so off the back of that, yeah. you ended up launching in the UK? Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't part of your roadmap to launch in the UK? It, eventually it was. Okay. But I think that really fast forwarded the conversation, definitely. And so why now in hindsight did that collaboration work really well well aligned audience was massive for us they were far bigger in the uk than we were people knew who represent well nobody knew who humantra were they just sort of had seen humantra on on certain stories or george using the products and so suddenly we were had access to a, a monumental audience which in the supplement space all you're really looking for is external validation right it's all very anyone can stand on on their own platforms and say our product's incredible Anyone can do it. But when you get trusted voices in communities backing that sentiment up, it's like gold dust. And so suddenly we had a brand validator in the UK that was far bigger than we ever anticipated or could have got if we just launched there off the back on our own. And yeah, we launched into the UK and, and we haven't looked back since. I've always wanted, like I said earlier about, you know, what Huda Beauty have managed to do, you know, build a truly global business with, you know, local in its roots. And I've always wanted to do the same. I thought more people can do it. I think this region is rife for more brands to pop up. I really do. And it's a great market. It's a good test market, right? Incredible it's market. It's a very uh, diverse. Incredible market. And I, I don't think people give it the credit it's due, especially from a consumer perspective. Young audience, extremely focused on health and wellness, probably willing to spend more than the average consumer in the UK. And like hyper connected, and you have an ability here to create noise in what is a big place, but also quite a small environment as well. And there's a lot of people here, yeah. And so you know, the UAE just served as the, the the best possible test market ever for us. I love it here. I think it's incredible. Yeah. Um, I've never looked back, and I think that yeah, you're seeing more and more brands now sort of defy the logical steps of setting up with, um, you know, a local business here and going about it. You're seeing more brands coming direct to the region and seeing just how brilliant it can be, how engaged the consumers are, spend levels, et cetera. So from my perspective, it just was a perfect test base. Yeah, we need, I think we, everyone's really excited about building, you know, global champions that are born here yeah. in the region. Every government wants that. Um, Everybody, all the investors want that, right? I mean, that's usually the biggest challenge in, in investing is that how do you invest in a business that can have, uh, that can become a global business? Yeah. Because, you know, our market is great, but it's not that big of a market. Yeah. So I think the the fact that you're doing that is uh, is definitely super appealing. How would you assess your life today, for example, versus, I don't know, when you came here? Um, um Look, what, the best way to frame it is like, for the first time in my life, I feel human. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I think I became very robotic in my mindset around things to maybe deal with failure and deal with loss. Or at school, I was very much in a process of not really making like decisions I wanted to make. It was always part of being like of a wider process or structure. 
And so now I feel incredibly free and human. I feel all levels of emotion. Um, for a long time, I had an inability to cry. I remember when we first spoke um, after, I think six months before my dad passed away two years ago, I, I remember I cried at Christmas in 2022. And then I didn't cry for another 18 months. And in that period, I lost my dad. My dad died. I went back to work. I think four days after he passed away, flew back to Dubai, got, got cracking straight back into the business and was, yeah, super. I was just non-human. I was almost like a robot. And I think my mum, she sent me a message before I went back to the UK last week. And she said that for a long time, um, she never asked me how I was because she was so scared of what I was going to say back to her. And so she couldn't deal with it. And I think everyone really realized that I was in a really bad place. And I look back now and think that, yeah, I was in a pretty dark place for a long period of time. And that upset me. My mum knew she couldn't help me. There's nothing that they could do to get me out of it. I need to maybe figure it out myself. But now, like, I feel, yeah, I'm the happiest I've ever been. I love what I do every day. I don't dread weekends. I don't dread, you know, dread that Saturday night or Sunday night now. I just love going in the office. And for me, it's not about, like, there's no end stage to this. It's not like, have I succeeded? It's just like, for as long as I'm enjoying it, then I'll just keep riding this way. But I'm also cognizant that it's not linear. You know, there are challenges along the way, but I think that duality of emotion is really important in people. You know, you can be really happy with life, but also struggle at times. I think so many people are very can be confused about duality. You know, I think if you're sad about something at work, you have to be sad in every aspect of your life. And I think that emotional maturity for me has really kicked in in the last couple of years. I have a life now, you know, I've rekindled a lot of friendships that maybe diminished when I was struggling, struggling. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have a life outside work and I think that then also lends itself to being better at work. I'm more creative than I've ever been. Well, um, you have some money now as well. It helps. Yeah, it, I mean, a hundred percent it helps. It's, it's look, entrepreneurship is all about struggle. You know, the statistics are, are obviously there. 80, 90% of companies fail. It's it's hard to be a founder. I think people don't understand how hard it is. And you've lived it through two startups where where you really struggled. You were in debt. You had a divorce. Like there, there, there was a, a lot of uh, challenges around that. And and mental health, I think, is is a is a really big thing. Yeah, definitely. But you know, when you now at least with with Humantra, you you have financial returns. You maybe you feel you've progressed more. What else? What else changed? Like why you? Why are you happier now? So, so the the money thing for me is is an interesting topic. Um, I listened to a really good podcast with with Russ, the rapper. He was talking to Jay Shetty, and and he thought he said that m money should flow. Mm -hmm. And the moment that anyone tries to stop money flowing is when issues can be caused. Mm -hmm. I think when you don't have any money, you're hell bent on on trying to just like not let any anything flow and and so that's really for me where issues started to creep in so it's not about like necessarily having money it's not having to worry about how i'm going to pay the bills or how i'm going to pay rent and i think removing that worry massively opened my mindset up for a long time i didn't think i was creative at all i thought creativity was an output that's how I perceive creativity. Like I can't sing, I can't draw, I can't do any of those what I thought creative pursuits were. Um, and then I realized that creativity is purely a mindset, you know, how you approach things. Like I would rather have a creative accountant than a book smart accountant. You know, I'd rather have a creative lawyer than a, a book smart lawyer. And so I realized that I am very creative in how I approach things. And so I think I, I love that more than ever about myself for a long time saying I was never a creative. But actually, you know, like I said, I think now I'm, I'm very creative. Outside of work, um, my fiance, Alex, has been um, a game changer for me in terms of mindset and like happiness outside of work. While I've lost my dad, my relationship with, with my mum in particular is better than ever. I talk to her all the time. Seeing her improve after my dad passed away has been incredible to watch and i think actually having a bit more 
of an ability to step back and see things for what they are and be present is probably the most liberating thing. I think when you're struggling and down in the dumps, you're very quick to be like thinking about the future or the past. I've got a tattoo on my wrist. Uh, it says chop wood, carry water. That's a Buddhist saying. And it's about like not dwelling on the past or thinking too much about the future. Just focus on the here and the now. And I think having that ability now for me is a game changer. How did you get to that? I mean, was there a, was there a book, a, a retreat? Someone said something to you. Like at what point did you think this is not sustainable and, and think, you know, things have got to change? Was there... Was it like a, a long process? I don't know, months, a year? Or was it like something that happened? Um, I think a series of events. So um, I got married in 2018. And then six months after, um, my wife left. I don't blame her at all. And I think at that point in time, it was a seminal moment for me. Like I never wanted something like that to define my life. I wanted that to be like, right, this is a, a really important lesson. I took total ownership of everything. I looked, I, I think that's introspection for me was critical. I almost zoned out of everything, personal relationships, friendships, a lot. Yes, I focus on business, but I really like focus on who I was as a person, what I liked doing, what I didn't like doing. Because I spent my whole twenties like trying to figure out my life, but also like making decisions in a in a relationship. Like I didn't really know who Charlie was. Like I left university and went on this mad quest to Dubai and trying to figure things out to maybe please other people. But I'd never really worked out like, well, how can I please me? And so I think step one was like accountability. It's all on me. Like don't blame other people for a relationship failing or a business failing. Like it was all my fault. And I think that introspection and accountability set me on a completely different course in life. And I would always employ, if there's a possibility for you to be 30 and on your own, for a period of time, it is like groundbreaking. Um, it changed my life for the better. Circumstances definitely helped as well. I've always had this insatiable sort of attitude to working hard. That's always stayed. Meeting Alex, my fiance, has massively helped as well. And I think it's about surrounding yourselves with the right people, with the right mindset. And I just feel incredibly fortunate in my life that, you know, that seminal moment happened I didn't dwell on it and let it define who I was as a person I used that really as fuel for what I really wanted to go and do surrounding myself with the right people you know a lot of it was circumstance and fortune but you know some of it um, manufactured in terms of you know the network I've tried to create but for me it just comes to be like there's no one going to pull me out of this apart from me yeah. Yeah. And I would, yeah, like I would say that I am, I'm very proud of myself. I always think that my dad would be incredibly proud of me. I remember Christian, my business partner, Hoppy said to me when my dad died, like, at least your dad started to see you tap into your potential. And my dad used to drink Himalayan lime r literally right up to the day he died. And so for him to not see everything else is tough. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, everything happens for a reason. So don't let certain moments define you. It goes back to the Chinese farmer story. Like I love that story. Um, you, you, in the moment, it might feel like the end of the world. Yeah. But I think if you just keep going and, and have a bit more of a, a balanced mindset, because I look back and think, I, I know why that didn't work out. You know, I know why my marriage didn't work out. You know, I know why that business didn't work out because there was something maybe bigger, you know, coming around the corner. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I the the Chinese story you said, uh, I love it. I've heard it in in a different form, obviously in business today. But like when people criticize you, don't take it, uh, you know, too personally. And when people praise you, don't take it yeah. too personally either. Uh, and and maintain your your balance, as you said, and don't let praise or criticism define you. Yeah, uh, basically. 100%. I love that. Um, I'm going to end with just some rapid fire questions yeah. uh, and just 
whatever comes to your mind, just let me know and then we can uh, we can wrap. So what's the first thing you would do when you wake up in the morning? I drink Humantra. <laughs> before you check your phone? Uh, yes, now I do. But before, like, I would have a very unhealthy relationship with my phone. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, but Humantra now, first thing in the morning, start my day, and, and then everything comes from there. What flavor? I switch all the time. But right now, lychee is, is my number one favorite. Okay. Um, an experience that has given you immense joy? Um, one particular experience. This is meant to be quick fire as well. Yeah. Or something that brings you joy. Home. Home. Yeah. For a long time, home for me was like where I would escape life and try and cut everyone else off. Home f and home for me now is a place of reflection, joy, happiness, uh, a meeting place. We love having people over, entertaining. Um, I look at my, you know, for for years, my mum and dad were incredible hosts. I loved being in that house. And so for me, like that change in my house becoming a home and is probably been the, the best thing for me. Love it. Um, what's the hardest habit you had to break? Probably um, exercise for me. Crazy to hear when I moved to Dubai until August 22, I never went to the gym. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Never went to the gym, was incredibly unhealthy, had a, a pretty, not the best relationship so from with 2014 alcohol. to 2022? Yeah, never went to the gym. Didn't go once. I may have played football here and there like a couple of times, but I was incredibly unhealthy. I ate terribly. Um, I was always tired. I had a, a fairly unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Not as such that I would go out to an extreme, but I would associate like escaping, you know, using alcohol to escape. So I think really for me, it was like transforming my health and wellness journey, ditching alcohol. All those, while they were hard to start with, has had the most profound impact on my life. Amazing. Um, what is your biggest fear as an entrepreneur? Not being good enough, it not working out. And um, what is one thing you tell your 25-year-old self? You'll get there. You'll get there. And what drives you today? Impact. Even just reading one review of a customer saying, like, I feel infinitely better since using Humantra. Or I recommended this to a friend and they can't stop using it. For me, it comes down to impact. And, and while, yes, we want a big outcome as a business, I think the biggest outcome is the impact we can have on people. And that may sound really romantic, but... I think waking up having impact in such a good way is like, I can't describe it. Chase what you're passionate about. Like it doesn't come naturally. It's not the first thing you think of. And you might not be passionate about a particular topic. It may be a part of a process. And so it's like that, that path to passion is not linear as well. Like you can find your way to what you're really passionate about. So yeah, for me, it just comes down to impact and I love what I do. Great. Where can people buy Humantra? So what's web the website? Is Depends where you are. It's a website, gethumantra.com or UK, humantra.co.uk. Um, we are on delivery. Mm -hmm. um, we are in Spinney's. Um, we are on, we're on Amazon as well. Um, and we're in a sort of curated selection of, you know, five-star hotels, premium gyms, studios in the UAE and the UK as well. Fantastic. It was great to host you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in to this conversation with Charlie Wright. I hope you enjoy it. To know more about Humantra, you can go to uh, gethumantra.com. Uh, as usual, don't forget to check out conversationswithlulu.com to look at all the other episodes. Make sure you are subscribed if you are listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any other podcast platform. And if you are watching this on YouTube, also, do leave us a rating and a review. It really helps in getting the show discovered. I wish you a great week ahead and see you in a few weeks.